Well, it's uh, Sunday, March. What is today? The 17th, uh, also known as St. Patrick's Day. And as per usual in Buffalo, uh, it's cold. Almost every St. Patrick's Day that I have been here, and that's for a very long time, I won't say how long, um, <clears throat> has either rained or snowed or been cold in some respect. <laughs> and and the, the beauty of it is that it's always been warm before St. Patrick's Day, and then it gets cold again. <clears throat> so we're back to cold. Um, some of us are wearing green. I'm not going to stand up, but I'm wearing green pants. <laughs> Uh, and I saw Jeff's green sweater uh, and Paul's green background. And Adam's, of course, got, you know, his ubiquitous green background. And Adam says he's wearing a green shirt, even though it looks blackish. Does it look better uh, now? It, it's hard to tell. It, it's really dark. Um, it's dark green here. Does that count? I'm oh, sorry? I've green. got some dark green here. Does that count? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yes, David, you're wearing green. Ryan's wearing green. Adam's wearing green. Knit this. I, I see. We, I see. Most of us got the memo. Um, for what it's worth, whatever that was. Mm. <clears throat> um. Anyway, um, I don't think we have a real agenda except that David has asked a question about um, wave to tap file converters for windows 11 so um with that let's start talking about that so david um your interest is um have you have you recorded some tapes or something that that into you know with uh with uh, audacity or something uh, yes, I've done that, but I've also done some original programming in, in, uh, using the 81 emulator, but the 81 emulator, when you're running under TS 2068 mode, will only save to a, a wave file for some reason. I don't know whether I forgot to flip or flop something or... I require something I don't know about, but you know what I mean. Well, okay, so um, let's let's talk about that for a sec. Does anybody else here use eighty one in twenty sixty eight mode? I've tried and had the same problem that David did. I can't save anything out of it in twenty sixty eight mode. Okay, okay. Um, David, have you tried Fuse or? Z yeah, I've tried. Uh, I've tried Fuse, but I, I, I guess maybe again. Uh, I'm not sure how <laughs> how it works. Uh, maybe somebody with a little bit more experience with Fuse knows how to do a conversion. Well, I mean, in terms of saving to a to a tap file, for instance, in Fuse. Well, Ryan does that quite a bit. Yeah. Do you use Fuse, Ryan? Yes. So what's your process? So starting starting from a wave file. Was it? Well, I think David's question was about, you know, doing some original programming in, you know, 2068 mode and then oh, how, okay. do you, how do you save that from Fuse? Um well basically um there's a, um, you'll have a media menu. So you'll do, you'll do your save normally with the save command and that's gonna go to a, the virtual tape. And so you, you deal with that under the media menu. I don't know if you've got a screen you could bring up. I am David. working on it. <laughs> okay. Um, and under media, you'll have a tape Submenu, and uh, assuming you didn't have it, so basically that that uh, tape, you'll keep track of what's loaded there. So if you loaded a tap file previously or saved something to the virtual tape, then you can just uh, under that tape submenu, you can write what's on the tape. But you can find you can view what's on the tape. So if you go in there into media tape. Um, I have to open a tape. 
you can browse to see that there's nothing in there right now. Yep. Oh. And then Menu. if oh. you just make a small, small program and save, one delete program. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, uh, not the best typist in Fuse. Because uh, I don't remember which, which, especially with the quote, which which magic keystroke on the Mac gets me the quote. All right, so I'm going to go to media. Well, you don't. You'll need oh, to sorry. save first. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah, you, that's right. You can save first. Yeah, you just um, save it. Okay, and, and if then you go back to me media tape. And then you can uh, browse just to see that it's recorded it. Yep. Oh, okay. interesting. I wonder what, oh, so if you, if, so now if you go back to the tape menu, you'll see. Hmm. Uh, oh, yeah. In the in this uh, in the SDL version, it doesn't show you that the tape hasn't been written. Um, Do you think it's the red in the lower right hand corner to indicate the little? Uh, oh, tape? yes. You think that means it hasn't been saved? Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember an SDL version. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. So I know in the regular GUI version, it'll say. Yeah. In the browser. Um. Yeah, it'll say if the tape's modified or not. So. Oh, it didn't change when I didn't change color when I. I think it just means you've got something on the tape. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Let's see. Yeah, in the regular GUI, it should say in the browser should say tape modified or not. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I'll tell you the problem um, with the Mac version is that the most recent version of um, of Fuse uh, that you can download from via sort of via the Fuse website is. Uh, 1.5.6 or 5. or 0.57 or something um and this is right this is 1.6 but i had to install this with um with homebrew and so i can only start this version from a terminal window and oh you use... can't you can't get the you can't get the gtk version no no that that version is um is kaput well, I'll I'll double check, but somebody I don't think anybody's uploaded or recompiled. Um, <clears throat> recompiled. Okay, they may not have, more recent. They may not have built the Mac version because. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, under at least under my Raspberry Pi, the the SDL that version yeah uh, <laughs> isn't the most stable <laughs> for some reason. And it's probably it might be the library. But yeah. uh, anyway, so once you save that, um, yeah, you've got tape file. And I think you can tell it TZX format too, as I remember. Yes, yes, you if can. You, if, yeah, if and, then, and in the Windows the... version, um, the dialogues are a little different, but uh, essentially the same thing. You know, where the it, Windows has that um, a little selector for whether it's going to be tap or or TZX. Um, and then loading. I think, well, I think that generally you just tell it the extension, and it'll automatically yeah. adjust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's kind of it. Um, and uh, you know, that's the saving side of things. Yeah. Um, and then I think in that I don't know about that version, but in that in the browser, um, if you've got multiple. Oh, yep. yep. Go to media, David. Go to tape. Cool. Go to open. And, and, and do you have any tap files, David, on your computer? Yeah, just a minute. Okay, cool. Two seconds here. <laughs> oh, you've got a thing over on the left-hand side that says tap FLS. Which I assume is your tap files. If we hey, get a chance, um, I would like maybe um, 
Ryan and Carl and I to talk about what we did on Bod Day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I want, I'm loving. To, I want to, you know, hear about that. Uh, and, and it's too bad that um, that uh, uh, I think it's John uh, from the groups I that I list who uh, uh, built a. Um, I think it's a Raspberry Pi Wi-Fi modem. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's supposed to go. It's supposed to um, act like a like a haze, and I'm I'm building a similar one uh, that uses an ESP thirty two. I'm gonna I've, I've got a little interface card that um, uh, one of the other guys uh, on the list uh, did a circuit uh, schematic, and I made some cards from it. And so my goal here is to be able to attach a Wi-Fi. Uh, modem to a 1000 or a 2068 it'll look like a, a 2050 modem to the oh, wow. um, well you still have to dial it with the telephone <laughs> well and so the one that i'm building has the yeah. noises yes yeah. it's got a little wave file player and a little speaker <laughs> that you put inside it Yeah, so, I actually ordered a FujiNet the other day for my Atari, so I should be able to. I, I would love to hear from you about that um, in some capacity because okay. I am considering the same thing. Yeah, I haven't <clears throat> gotten it yet, but I should get it soon. So, David, once you get something, do you want to share your? Let us know and share your screen again. Yeah. Okay. All right. So sorry about this, but uh, it's one of these things that when you're looking for it, it disappears on you absolutely yes uh -huh. and you know what it'll be in the last place you look you know, uh, i have a question uh, conrad are you are you can you hear me yeah conrad are you new there we go there how we about go. that now we can, can hear, hear you. you okay good so conrad you look new i mean new to us i've, I've been here a couple times in the last year or so that's about it okay okay have you introduced yourself to us? I think I did. Um, oh, okay. Let's see. I do have an old Timex Sinclair 1000. Let's see, what do I do? I'm re retired in the last couple of years. I'm just trying to get started with some of the projects I've had in the back of my mind from way back. When you're too busy with the work and everything else, raising the family. So, um, oh, go ahead. The, the, I'm recently became a ham radio operator a couple of years ago. Um, that's so far that's about, about it. Well, you said you have some projects in mind. What what projects for the one thousand you have in mind? Pardon? You said you have some projects in mind for the one thousand. Uh, what are we talking about? Well, I just want to basically get it going again and see what I haven't used it in like what 30 40 years ah <laughs> it's in a box in my closet well uh you've reached the right place all right Conrad have you joined the groups.io list the which there's a there's a um email list uh, hosted by groups.io and the name is ts2068 but it's every everything that's uh you know time makes sinclair there's there's no i haven't didn't know about it no okay okay i'll put it in the chat for you and then okay in, uh, sure uh because because i think everybody who's here today is on that list and at least uh two people have been talking about uh 1000 related stuff for the past several weeks <laughs> All right, David. So, what do you got? Looks like you have a raw. This is the, probably your wave file. Yeah, That's my wave file. Yes. Okay. Not very big. It's only three hundred two. Okay. All right. So you did browse tape. All right. So uh, yeah, go ahead and hit close on that, and you should be able to load that. Just do load quote quote. Yeah, okay. Uh, Load is, you know, L. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. J, J, J. J. I'm sorry. 
Let is L. <laughs> I didn't hear you. Sorry. Oh, her way. Oh, okay. And then, oh, good. You got it. Okay. Let's see what happens. Oh, good. All right. Sweet. Uh, is this machine language, David? Uh, yeah, it's a compiled Pascal program. Compiled Pascal. Okay. Oh, interesting. It does it compile it to C because it said the the file extension was dot C. No, no, no. I use dot C. It may, it may, it may convert it to C and use a C compiler. Okay. No, no, right. no, 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 no. Uh, I use yeah. dot C yeah, to yeah, mean yeah. that it's machine code. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Where are you going to say? So, David, what happens if you list it? Uh, all right. All right. So, um, okay. Go He's to. He's got two segments. Yep. 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 He's got two segments on that wave file. Do you know how big your um, how big your code portion is, David? Uh, not off the top of my head. All right. Do you think it's less than um a K or something? Less than one K or? Hey, David. Yeah. Do we, or maybe Adam can quickly point to the that that little header utility. Um. um oh, you need the runtime to run the code. No, we just need to know how big his uh, code file is. This has already been compiled, Gustavo. Um, In the Fort Worth, the Fort Worth user group tape. Yeah, but but that will that work on a wave file? You, yeah, infuse it'll it'll work on the wave file. Okay. Uh, um, I forget where that's posted, but maybe I could post it real quick. Okay. Uh, so David, close this window. That's that's browsing your raw tape. Now, go to uh, media and go to tape and do, um, let's do open. Oh no, clear. I'm sorry, this is, this is clear is the option you want. So cancel this. It's been a while since I've used these uh, menus. So go to media and then clear uh, tape. Now do um, let's do save 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 this program, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I see you use a Larkin, a Larkin file extension there. Yep, press any key. All right, now do uh, save uh, whatever the name of that thing was, world.c. Just press enter. Okay, I posted that on the groups there, David. Okay, into the chat or somewhere else. Uh, the email just on the group's io okay okay so david now do save quote world.c oh don't you need oh, to you delete got yourself into codes. a world of hurt there you need to delete delete yeah. delete, delete. <laughs> delete the question marks if oh, there's yeah, more than yeah. one how do you get how do you get out of that color is it um okay now now you're good no, he's got i don't remember cursor. exactly but inside the pascal you can get the size of the of the compile answer yep. file yep but yeah. we're just gonna we're just gonna take a guess for okay. now and then do um code mm. give me it's going to be on fuse Ex extended shift control you got no, cosi 27000 and you need one more zero david before the comma yeah and then do comma do 512 i mean i can't imagine you're 
program being more than 512 bytes. Uh, I'm sorry to... Uh, I can't... The, the compiled Pascal program, I'm, I'm yeah. just taking a guess that it's less than 512 bytes. So just type in 512 and press enter. And then, yep. Okay, now let's go to media and browse. And you should see both of those files listed. Media tape browse, yeah. Browse. And there's your <clears throat> um, your loader and in theory your uh, your Pascal program. Okay, close this window. There, notice it says tape modified. That means you hadn't saved the yep. virtual tape yet. Yep. Go to write media tape, and then write exactly. And then you have to give it a you know a file name. Um, but type in dot tap. Yep. And then save that. And David, you should be able to sort of reset your machine. Yeah, exactly. And then you can mount that tape again. So go to the media tape, uh, open. Yep. Well, it's still the one that's just in memory right now. But oh, was it still okay. attached? Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, and you got to do load, David. Don't follow my advice about which key is load. <clears throat> JPP. JPP, right. No, nope, David, just type just type load. There you go. And it's not going to auto run because um, we didn't specify that. Oh, that's right. We forgot. So let's see what line. you got. Okay. Well, we didn't save enough. Yep, we didn't save enough. But we got. So <clears throat> you need to find out what size oh. your. Um, so can he can he grab that loader I uploaded? Let me go to my email. The, the problem was you save the basic part, but do you not save the code part? The code part is starting at the twenty-seven. We did, but 000. we didn't. We didn't get For enough. Us. Is what the problem is. <clears throat> Oh, we don't know. We don't know the, the actual size of the compiled program. You gotta, you gotta click OK on the exit fuse dialog. So, David, I'm going to stop your screen sharing. <clears throat> um. So David, the go go back to your you know your Pascal thing and find out how big your compiled program is, and then that's the the save uh, code that you need to do to get it to work. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, two seconds here. That's okay. You can you can work, and we'll you can let us know when you're ready, and we'll come back to you. Okay. <laughs> Um, I just want to oh, find my participants. Here we go. Uh, Chris, Chris on an iPhone. Are you a new person? <laughs> no, uh, no, not not really. Old, not new. Uh, relatively old, but uh, <laughs> sort of old, sort of our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> sort, of, sort of sort of new to this group um, okay good. i joined as one of the first participants a long time ago oh i just have i just have not had the time nor the ability to to come online with you guys it's always oh. been one thing or another did i drive you uh, away it's okay yeah <laughs> no <laughs> no 
no, nobody's driven me away. It's just uh, so many things going on. That's all. Well, so um, tell us your story real quick. So, okay. Uh, well, long story. and uh, But real quick, uh, I was 15 years of age. My dad bought me my first computer back in 19, whatever the heck it was. And uh, I taught myself assembly language. First, it was basic, obviously. But then, uh, you know, I got intrigued with it. And I, I bought that book uh, by Tony something or rather about machine code yeah tony baker uh, tony baker yes um unfortunately uh long story i had all the books i had all my computers had everything and unfortunately i got divorced and i was cleaning out my house and i just started throwing everything in the dumpster <gasps> yeah and i loaded two dumpster full of stuff and it all went to the dump because i had just so much stuff and uh, i just could not hold on to everything and control everything but now i regret doing that obviously and i'd like to you know get back into doing what i was doing for no other reason obviously than just my own self curiosity and uh so long story short five six years of programming machine code by myself i made some programs sold them in london ontario oh. to some other people some computer places at the time and uh, you know, just recently, thankfully, uh, I think my father had found a couple of my own cassette tapes. Oh, my and gosh. Yeah, there's some machine code on it, and I wouldn't mind looking at it again and getting back into it. But I don't have a computer. I wouldn't mind buying one. But I see you guys operating an emulator. And if I could throw an emulator on one of my computers here, is it possible for me to download or upload or somehow get this machine code onto one of the emulators? So the short answer is yes. Um, which computer now, did you have? Was it a one, uh, you know, an, an 81? Well, I started out with this, I started out with the ZX80 and then I went to the, 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 T, yeah, the, the Timex 1000. And okay. then I, I do believe I got one after that, but I can't remember what for the life of me, which one it was. Was it silver or black? So if it was silver, it would be um, um, the 2068. It was definitely color because there was color involved with it, right? Okay, and, uh, probably probably the 2068. So your I'm tapes, thinking 2068, yeah. Yeah, your tapes are uh, like 1,000 tapes? Uh, there's, yeah, there's ZX, there were the 81s. 81, yeah. okay. So I've been lapped lax um but our last meeting at the beginning of this month uh joe who's on here today uh did a little demo of um rescuing some tapes that he had purchased back in the 80s right right and uh there are and i'll i'll post the i'll post the um last meeting soon um but there's a couple tools uh <clears throat> you want to get a program called audacity which is yep. free um and obviously you'll need a tape player right um and a little mono you know cable to plug into sure. your yep. um yep. into your computer and then you can record hold on just a second oh, uh you can record um record the tape into the computer through audacity and um, <clears throat> you can see as it's recording, you can see what the waveforms look like, right? And you do wanna uh, try to get a, a decent uh, volume level. Yes. With, with the, uh, the 81, uh, David, can you hold on just a minute, please? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> with the 81, um, you can, uh, the audio, the, the, the way it's encoded, is the zeros are four peaks and the ones are nine peaks, if I recall correctly. This is all in in um, in the demo that that Joe did, uh, and Joe spent a lot of time uh, just sort of pre-processing in Audacity to clean up the um, the audio signal as much as he could by hand, like by hand, fixing each bit literally by hand. You might not guys, have to do that. Guys. I, I don't mean to interrupt and I don't want to be rude, but unfortunately, my granddaughter has just arrived. And well, that, that's she's just two years old. Absolutely. And it's our, and it's our first one. Awesome. So <laughs> I'd love to talk to you. I don't know what your name is, sir. That's talking David, right now. That's David awesome. Anderson. 
Yes. David Anderson. And you don't live too far from me. I'm in Buffalo. Yeah. I'm I, just I, outside Niagara Falls, Ontario. So I, I know. <laughs> and I would, I'd actually love to come and visit with you or, or talk to you personally. If, and I could bring you the tape or whatever, and maybe we could uh, absolutely maybe look at that or something. Let's do that. That sounds in like in your future. Yeah, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't mind uh, coming back on here like next week or whatever, and uh, and and going over this. But I, unfortunately, I, I hate to have to say that I have to go because I got to go cook. I got to go cook bake cookies with my granddaughter. And, uh, I, absolutely, Chris. I'm Way more not apologize. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, because it's first time I've been on talking, and uh, I, I'd, well, I'd love to stay in chat. So, um, Chris, till next time, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll see you later. Uh, I, <laughs> Thank I you. Did it. Is there some way that I can email you my phone number and stuff, David? Or... Yeah, yeah. Um, let me put it in the. Do you have the chat available to you? Yeah. Just okay. I'm, I just put my email in uh, in the chat. And um, if you're That's on the group, fantastic. Groups, yeah, just email me directly. Yep, I will okay. do that. Okay. Cool. Very good. Thank you very much, guys, okay, for listening no to my sob story, and uh, I'll talk. I'll talk to you next week. <laughs> awesome. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, bye. Yeah, the best kind of cookies. <laughs> Hi, sweetie pie. Hi. Uh, okay, David, Sally, you ready? Yeah. Um, and again, it doesn't seem to. Wait, well, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> So, oh, I got it to work. Gee whiz. All right, show us. Now, now you have to show us your success. Uh, okay. Now share your screen. <laughs> this is as chaotic as a regular in-person user group meeting. <laughs> now he has to remember how he did it. Right. <laughs> oh, I remember how, to, how I did it, but as I so, said, this is the first time I've done it with fuse which was a little bit uh... so david did you manage to get uh get your your loader and your machine code saved to a tap file uh yes i did that's how i loaded this thing okay all right so let's uh run us show us the you know show us your juice all right okay Six kilobytes. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Let me do something here. Yeah. Do the reset. Machine reset. Yep. Yeah, that'll work. Are you, are you trying to reset your machine, David? Or are you trying to do something yes. else? Go, just go to the reset right there. The second option down. Ah. And yep. Okay. All right. And it, your tape should still be mounted. Is that right, Ryan? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So mm -hmm. you should just, you can just go to browse David to see if, if your files are still there. Yeah, there we go. Oh, wow. Okay. 5k file. Now, wow. Also right. in the browser, you can double click on one of those to jump the tape. It's for some reason, it didn't one. save the, uh, for some reason, it didn't save the. Uh, I I had a line one to auto start it, and it, for some reason, it didn't. Uh... It didn't uh, do the auto start. Oh, it... yeah. Well, the loader we need to resave with a line command or line option rather. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what I did. Okay. All right. Well, let's see what happens, David. Go ahead and. Um... Mm -hmm. I think in that this is the runtime of the compiler. The minimum size yeah. of 5k. Probably. Well it it well it will it'll bundle that with it, which is why the code block length is kind of long. Oh okay. Look at that. Very nice, David. Yeah. So So that's uh that was the program done in compile Pascal. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So now now you're ready to go. Mm. Or, or something. Uh, <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> no. It seems to me that uh, 
somewhere I've got a cataloging program that will catalog the. Uh... It makes it possible for you to install more recent versions of Mac OS. Sorry, go ahead, David. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We install what? That was irrelevant. Yeah, I'm not, not sure what that was. What was going on? That may have been just some anyway, extra audio from Brian. I've got one way of. Uh, uh, I've got one way of working it because, as I said, the the only programs uh, I could find worked on a only on an older version of Windows, or I needed a machine that ran uh, authentic DOS, not the emulator. It won't work under the emulator. For some oh, reason. with uh, Warriego or something? Yeah. Or the DOS emulator? It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. OK. The other, thing, the other thing, David, you might be able to write to, you know, Paul Faro. I mean, he's not the only one that does, that has part with the 81 emulator. But, you know, if you want it to have features, like, saving to tap files, you know, maybe let him know and then he can maybe, you know, take that under consideration as a as a feature request for mm -hmm. 81. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, anyway, thank you for your time and trouble. Thank you, David. That was that was uh well in it wasn't just helpful to you because uh Jeremiah said it was helpful to him. He's starting to learn or starting to mm -hmm. use Fuse as well. Yeah. So that's cool. Because uh uh, Pascal is about the only compilable language I know. I'm not, I don't know any assembler mm -hmm. at all, except for a few routines that uh, Larry Kenny gave me way back when. And uh, I've seen a few things like um, um, I have a book, a uh, French language book that talks about uh, the spectrum and how to access uh, um, Raw routines, uh, uh, how to access raw routines through uh, a high soft Pascal. Cool, cool. Well, so, now yeah. that you got a WAV file too, David, you could load that now into eighty one, right, and get your get same hello world to work. But it's a lot of work to go through two emulators. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, Adam, yeah. since since we are now uh, individually outnumbered by uh, people in Albuquerque <laughs> on this particular meeting, um, <clears throat> this past week was, uh, was both the Ides of March and before that it was BOD Day. And uh, I, I guess apparently you did something for BOD Day. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, this, my name is Adam Tronfo. Um, if you haven't seen me before, uh, David, I think you're introducing me to talk about Bod Day, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> All right. Um, well, on uh, this meeting, we currently have um, four people who participated in it. We've got myself. We've got, there were five people, by the way, at my house on Tuesday. Um, and Bod Day is a uh, infrequent event that happens uh, on this year. It happened on March 12th. Uh, 2024 because of like uh, the shortness. Oh, uh, Brian just sent a picture of uh, all of us uh, on um, the day of Baud Day. Um, but uh, 3, 24, 24 is like 300 Baud, uh, 2400, oh, 300 Baud, 1200 Baud. And um, well, it all adds up to be March 12th. And uh, we got together baud. and we had um, a pretty good time. Uh, in that picture uh, on the left is Carl. Uh, next to him is Ryan. Next to him is myself wearing an Astro K T shirt. Yeah, what's um, with that shirt? And we have shirt? the only person uh, who is not uh, who's not here is Rick, and next to him is Brian, uh, the, uh, who just joined our meeting for the first time, actually. Cool. So that that's cool. Thanks for posting that, Brian. Um, and I kind of wrote up what we did. I'm not sure if anyone had time to read my freaking four page update, but uh, basically the four of us got together, or five of us got together um, around seven. I don't know, six o'clock, seven o'clock on Tuesday, and we tried calling up some bulletin boards uh, using my 2068, my Atari 600 XL. And there was a lot of uh, phone numbers that were busy. Um, so it didn't work great, but it did work because we're also able to connect um, using uh, a program on my Windows machine called SyncTerm, 
um, through Telnet. And um, yeah, we had a good time. We used um, the time to use the 2068, just BS, which is what people do um, about old computers. And when you get five of them together, and some of them are Atari users, and some of them are Timex users, um, that's enough people to separate into two groups to <laughs> um, chat about just their own computer systems and which is better. Um, and I sort of floated between them all, uh, telling them that they're equally good or equally as fun, much fun. I don't know. We uh, talked about if which one's better. You know, they're all. <laughs> we were just talking about topics for that particular system. That's I all. understand. I'm just joking around. <laughs> I know. You know? <laughs> um, so, Carl, why don't you take it from there and tell us a little about what we did, too? Well, let's see. What else did we do? We got pizza, which was nice. Uh, you know, nice to share some food with everybody. Um, then I think like, like, uh, Adam saying, you know, we kind of broke into groups, uh, you know, I know Ryan came over and then, you know, me and Ryan were talking about time X stuff and, um, you know, Adam would drop in occasionally and then I can hear the Atari guys, you know, I think they were trying to dial up, uh, you know, some of these BBSs and of course they would either just get busy signals or it just. I think you were trying to use Telnet even on the Atari and it would just, yeah. um, it would just, you know, once you connect it to the Telnet server, it would not be able to connect to the BBS. So anyway. Right. The way it still worked, it was still busy even through Telnet on the other end because there were so many people, I guess, because of Baud Day trying to connect. No, right. That's what we figured. Right. Okay. And um, so what else did we do? I mean, Atari wise, I really, you know, like I said, I'm not a big Atari guy. I never had an Atari. I just recently got one from from Rick there that was in the picture. Uh, he got myself and Ryan, uh, you know, the original 800 mm -hmm. Atari um, with a disk drive. Um, so now we have Atari Ataris, but like I said, I, I really haven't had time to, uh, you know, mess with it. It's kind of was more of a collecting thing. You know, I, I'm trying to collect all of these older systems before they get so expensive that it's just uh you know we're not not uh financially you know viable to collect all of them but anyway uh you know i still want to get like a you know like the 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 atari 600 xl that adam has it's kind of expanded right to 64k it's basically an 800 xl right, right? it has but, a composite mod in it um, right otherwise it's rf only yeah mm -hmm. so i mean it's 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 a nice form factor you know it's exactly. it's, yeah. it's uh nice small it's smaller than the 800 XL, and if it does everything the 800 does, it has a cartridge port on it too, right? Just like course, 800. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, why why waste more space if you can just get the uh, 600 XL? And so I kind of want to eventually get one of those, and maybe even one of the ST machines eventually. I don't know the 1040 ST or or something in that realm. I'm not really uh, like I said, I'm not an Atari guy, so I don't. You know, it's easy enough to go find out what's going on there, but I, you know, I don't know it off the top of my head what the, you know, all these ST machines are, are 16 bit machines, right? They're not yeah. the 8 bit machines like the, uh, the 800, the 600, and even the well, XL series. Carl, I don't want to bore people here with Atari talk too much. Right, right. So, um, <laughs> what? I thought maybe it'd be fun to, uh, have you talk about your uh, ZX80 clone that you right. and we tested it out. So we, so we were kind of coming to that. And so the, you know, once we, I was just kind of explaining my, interest in atari right so that's kind of where i'm coming from with that um as far as the timex stuff yeah so we uh you know i've kind of posted some stuff not too much lately on on the zx80 uh you know this clone that I've, i'm building uh that will will code 2009 uh developed and uh, you know so i had to get all the parts for it i know um uh richard is also he also has a board uh, it's older version than mine, and so he's trying to get some parts for it. And uh, so we've been kind of conversing over email, trying to, you know, he doesn't have his working yet, I don't think. Uh, he's still missing, like, the video jack and stuff like that, so that kind of prevents, <laughs> well, I guess he could manually connect it, right? But um, anyway, uh, so I've got all the parts for that. I built one up, but all I get right now, well, initially, I didn't get anything. Um, so I posted some things on the forum or on the groups IO about some troubleshooting there. And it looks like the ceramic oscillator resonators that are modern, you know, they have the loading caps already built in. Oh, yeah. um, and this, this design is obviously from that era, from the, from the eighties. Right. So uh, when I had used that new oscillator or new, the 
modern resonator, uh, there's a loading cap that's on the board, right? I, you know, I didn't know any of this. So I was getting like a really lower frequency, like 5.5 megahertz or something like that. It's supposed to be 6.5, right? Maybe it was even lower than that. But anyway, took the loading cap out and it got up to about six uh, megahertz. But that, you know, the video generation is all controlled by that clock. So if it's low, uh, you're not going to, you know, you need to get 15 point, I don't know, what is the 15.6, 15.7 kilohertz uh, signal to the, to your monitor, right, to your TV. And so it was really way down in a 14. So the TV was like, not even, not even going to do anything with that. So I ended up taking a ceramic oscillator off of a Timex Carl, 1000. Carl, um, can I just uh, stop you there for one moment before we uh -huh. get too deep into the details? Because <laughs> uh, even that's, you know, above my pay grade, um, basically what we ended up doing is hooking up to two different monitors um, and it was in PAL mode for one thing we turned out, we're not sure why. Um, and so it was rolling the screen and then we hooked it up to a, like this, what is it called? An annual monitor, David, that I have that you recommended? Oh, E-yo-yo. Yeah, yeah. And it can take <laughs> a million different signals um, and it was able to uh, get the signal properly from that ZX80. Um, is the, that right, Carl? Uh, sorry, Adam. Right. Yeah. The, the, the rolling screen is because you have a fifteen. <clears throat> sorry, fifty uh, hertz and not sixty hertz. Mm. Right. And the sync in your monitor is out of the of the limits. Normally, right. using a with, NTSC yeah. TV rather than. But we didn't know it was supposed to be uh, in uh, fifty well, or sixty hertz. Well, it, it example, is. In, in Argentina, we have PAL, uh, we have NTSC also. Oh, didn't but know that. The, the only differentiation, if you have a correct monitor or TV, only see in black and white or color. But you see the, the, the frame in sync. If the TV or the monitor has the possibility to sync with this uh, horizontal frequency and vertical frequency. Yeah, right, and I just yeah. want to say that, you know, that the, there is a diode on there to change the counter, right, ah. in, in the ZX80. So it is it is supposed to be an NTSC. That's what that diode's for, okay. is to turn it into NTSC so that it, uh, you know, I know I know when on, on, on the yo-yo or whatever you want to call it, it did show NTSC. It did say PAL for some reason, but, you know, maybe it was trying to sync it up or something like that. But we also, you know, it did say NTSC too. But yeah. granted, all I'm getting is a white screen. Right, so at least I'm getting a video signal, but I'm not getting any pixel data. I think we saw something flashing, and I don't yeah, think yeah, we saw kind of a cursor. We did. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the the ZX80, as far as I've seen pictures of, I don't, I don't, I don't have one. That's why I'm building this thing, but I don't see it ever having a flashing cursor. Right, even the ZX80, oh. the cursor did not flash. That's why it's blank because you not cannot sync, put the sync uh, pulse on the on the video signal if you cannot. Uh, see any letter or any dot on the on the active screen, you never get the the pulsing at the end. Mm -hmm. Maybe the video is 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 problem, and any transistor or any part inside the 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 video path generation is is born. Well, you know the the thing with the ZX80, right? Everything's discrete, so we can figure that out. I yeah. just it's just going to take some time. If this was there are people that you've they've had this problem even on a ZX81, right? Where the pixels will be either, you know, missing some rows or, you know, you type like print and it'll it'll show up, but you can't really read it. It's garbly goop, you know. And uh, there's some a lot of people are saying it could be RAM, you know, because uh, obviously the display file. Uh, is stored in RAM on the 81, well, stored in RAM on the 2682, but it's a different kind of display file. But anyway, um, so, you know, there's there's some troubleshooting that I have to do there. You know, it it, there, it uses a pixel clock, a shift register, right, to store all um, the... If you put the scope on the video signal, you see the normal video format? I see the normal video, but like I said, it's all after, you know, it's all high. So it's all white. There is no... Yeah. There's no uh, is, drops is down. Not, that is not normal. It well, I mean, not. it's normal for a white screen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm getting a video signal, but yeah, you're right. I'm not getting any pixel data, like I said. That's so it's not either. It's not clocking the pixel data out or something. Uh, you know, there's there's some stuff that's going on there that may involve 
me changing some resistors out so I can put some adjustable ones in there and figure out what's going on. But it sounds like uh, a, a decoder. Sounds like a ULA uh, problem. Yeah. Well, but there's well, no there's ULA, no U Gustavo. No. It, no. This is a recreated board. This is yeah. Uh, it's a ZX80 made, ah. made all with discrete parts. So it's all parts. all discrete, right? Oh. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, it's easy enough to figure it out. Well, not easy enough, but it's you know all the all the guts are laid bare, right? So we can get to what we need to get to there yeah. to figure it out. But um, uh, anyway, I just, you know, like I said, the whole point of me making that was because I got the Chroma 80 and I, I kind of want to use that, right? But I need to get a ZX80 machine, no right? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Cool. Uh, I'd like to move on a little bit about what we did because, Jamari, are you still here? Yeah. I think. Hello, he's there. Jeremiah? Yep, he's still here. Well, uh, we yeah. did. I did load up. Hey, hey Jeremiah. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, so we did have a chance to load up your 10 minute adventure, um, and uh, I did show uh, Brian, or excuse me, Ryan and Carl, um, and I also Brian as well, uh, your program, and it was kind of cool to check out in real hardware, and I did post a picture of that to the group, uh, and you saw it. Um, but if anyone here isn't familiar with uh, Jeremiah's learning and teaching himself the 80 code, um, in the last couple of weeks he posted a program that he's working on that's uh, going to be like an NES game, right? Kind of like uh, Dragon Warrior. Is that right? Uh, yeah, something something along the lines of uh, of Dragon Warrior for the NES. Which is like an RPG. Um, and he posted something so I could try it out. Um, and it was fun. I, I mean, I just was able to move around a little stick figure um, and run into a lake that was animated, which was cool. Um, and he's got some mountains on the screen. And, you know, it looks cool. So uh, I hopefully make some progress on that because now I need ten minutes of my time to to try it out. <laughs> well, could, kudos too on that because I know, obviously there was sound. I, I assume you're using the the sound chip with that. Uh, and I think when you ran into boundaries, right? I think maybe the mm -hmm. water it would make another. That's how the sound would come out. And then of course <laughs> there was animation on the guy, right? The the character. So and that you that was way more than you had when you showed us two weeks ago. <laughs> Yeah, pretty pretty cool. Uh, what else did we do? Uh, we oh we tried to load up my um, well Ryan's one thousand and oh check it out. We've got David sharing a picture of his uh well not his oh. his personal book but not the book he wrote. But um right, I just want to show this real quick. Uh, yeah. So Jeremiah, I mentioned this to you on the on the list, but it's worth uh, you know doing a plug on on our, our meetings here. This I, I've read a bunch of books. Um, you know, machine language programming uh, books, especially for the the eighty one, and there's none for the you know twenty sixty eight per se. Um, but this one for the spectrum, it's you know close enough to the eighty one or to the twenty sixty eight in terms of of programming. The text in this thing and the examples are just mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. I cannot recommend this thing enough. I mean, in a, I don't know how many how many books on programming I've read, but you know, there are good books on programming and there are terrible books on programming. This is one of the good ones. This is really worth the, I don't know what it was, 24 bucks or something from um, from Amazon. I think it's print on demand. Really yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So, and, and all the text that's in it, uh, all the programs, of course, are listed in the book and also you can download them and try them out. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's... It's it's the way the the way that the that the uh, the text and the programs are interspersed um, and just the detail into which you know the authors go in terms of of um, you know stepping through each of these little little processes right um, I just happened to open to a page that talks about reading a Kempston joystick and it walks you through all of the, you know, the little steps of reading a Kempston joystick. Unfortunately, that will not apply to you on the 2068. <laughs> well, I think it already works with a joystick, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's using it for the 2068 joystick, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, Jeremiah. Uh, what else did we do? Uh, we tried using the 1510 uh, player replica that Carl uh, has made. And it turns out my 1000s keyboard um, is laxed and isn't working anymore, even though it's only been sitting on my desk. And so Carl opened it up because that's what he does. And it turned out like the ribbon cable broke again. Oof. And uh, so Carl took it home and kind of put it, uh, 
the what is it the eighty ones keyboard with the rub out on it? He's got a new old stock yeah. one. Ryan Ryan bought one for for that one thousand that he had that somebody like cut the key out of it. So I still have that. I'll put that in there. That that's a modern one, so it doesn't have the you know I know Stuart sent me some original ones mm -hmm. which are made out of that same material right from back in nineteen eighty and and that's that's the problem that material. It gets brittle, and then you bend it, and it, it'll just crack, and it can go through the, the um, traces, right? The little, sure. the new one that Ryan bought, the plastic is something different. You know, it's it's more modern, and then the traces are obviously sprayed on or however they do it. So that I don't think will break, will crack as much because it's actual like a plastic. It's some kind of acrylic or something i don't know but anyway it's it's different it's made better <laughs> than you know it was back in 1980 which i'm sure they used that material because it was the cheapest thing they could get right well interestingly i had never seen a timex 1000 keyboard removed i didn't know it was just a sticker so yeah. <laughs> uh, carl just took it off and i about had a heart attack and he's like, oh, now you're seeing, I don't know if he said something like how the sausage is made or something. Yeah. But when I saw that keyboard come off of the computer, I was like, what is he doing? I, I figured it had to be, I don't know, a screw on there or something. But uh, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, if, if I may. Go. Ages ago, when we had a hard time getting replacement QL membranes, I bought a roll of copper. Thin enough to overlay on the original traces and reinforce the break on the backside with an adhesive tape and use the copper to rebuild the trace. And it was a copper foil. Oh. With an you adhesive know, on one side. They, yeah, I've got some of that stuff, but it's 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 kind of made for like shielding. You know, well, that's kind of what, but this was yeah. This circuit board repair originally. Right, right. Yeah, so it's hard, it's hard to find that stuff these days. Right, it's hard to find that stuff these days. So it's a, they still make it, but it's much harder to find those things. There's also a... um. Yeah, see, Rich has, that's the paint. new... Oh, hang yeah, on. that's the new style. Uh, uh, see how... Hang on, Rich. Hold on, let me just uh, spotlight you. Thank you. We Would I be out video. of place if I had to find a box with some replacement membranes? For the QL or for just... No, the 1,000. No, I mean, they're they're needed because, like I said, those original ones, you know, Adam's machine was working, you know, but I had already cut the tails back quite a bit. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was kind of bending, but, you know, just sitting at his desk, you know, those, that, that material just, you know, well, it wasn't it bending it anymore. Magic. It actually, it actually, you know, like uh, cracked just sitting there. So the well. stuff that Rich shows, <laughs> well, the is stuff that, that is... Rich shows is uh, that's a different kind of plastic that they put the membrane, you know, the traces on. So that I think that was much more durable. Right. The I don't think it outgasses. And right. that outgassing is the plasticizer. Right. That's why, you know, like computer cases and stuff like that get really brittle, right? It's the same kind of process, right? It, you know, it's going to dry out eventually. And I think the plastic that Rich showed, it doesn't, it's not that type, kind of plastic where it needs, uh, you know, it's not going to dry out, I don't think. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'll see what I can find then. Yeah. Because like I said, you know, there's, there's obviously a 1000 version, right? Which has the enter and the rub out, I mean, enter and the delete. And then of course the ZX81. So the 1000 ones are more uh, harder to find because I don't think anybody makes those uh, aftermarket. Right, yeah, the, there, there is a, a, an 81 aftermarket keyboard that shows up a lot on um, eBay. Right. Um, yeah. And has like but whoever that. whoever makes those, you know, I, I mean, kudos to them for doing that. You know, I appreciate know. it. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't know. You know, obviously, they probably need to do a run of like a thousand of them or a hundred of them. You know, however many of them. And I just don't know that uh, it, it would be nice to be able to talk to one of those guys maybe and see if they could change the overlay. I mean, they do make them because they have a one thousand version that you just stick over the ZX eighty one version. 
Yeah. Right. So they so they already have the artwork. They just you know can we make like a hundred of those or <laughs> <laughs> you know for us guys over here with the one thousands that care about the rub out and the enter and the delete. <laughs> well, there yeah there I mean to your point, Carl, there are companies that um you know that, that make that sort of thing obviously because you know folks are getting it but um i think i think uh if i recall correctly there's a company called maverick that makes a um vinyl plastic i'm not sure what kind of plastic it is but they can make overlays like that with mm-hmm. little punch outs for the keys and stuff but i don't know if they can do the mylar portion um <clears throat> Well, I think Tynemouth and like RWAP over in the UK, those are the guys that kind of made these runs yep. for the ZX81. And so obviously they have all the artwork and stuff like that, and they know who they used. It's just a matter of, you know, is it financially feasible to, uh, you know, have them make a run? I don't, I don't know what their minimum quantity would be for that. So Yeah, I don't know. And, and speaking of which, there's a um, somebody in Germany sells a just the um the sort of the outline overlay portion of the 2068 um keyboard um which is not the portion that gets worn away on a 2068 keyboard it's the it's the physical keycaps themselves that get worn away but um he sells both wait david i don't understand what you mean what do you mean mean, it's just the uh so similar well, to it's the... a key it's it's the overlay well not the overlay but it goes around the keys it's a oh, sticker yeah. part that's part of the case you mean it's a sticker it's it's a sticker okay. just like the literally it's a sticker yeah. like really? the um oh um yeah oh, the 1000 keyboard is. Is, is, oh. is, a, is a sticker yeah and it peels I mean, off it and... it kind of does some of them do wear out because i you know i've bought some of those from that guy oh and, did you, you know, I, yeah awesome quality uh you know i don't know how he's the silver ones he's kind of out of. It doesn't seem like he has any of the silver ones. So I've got, you know, like the black TC2048. I've got the black TC2068. I do have a silver one that I got previously for the for the 2068. Yeah, see, that's what uh, you know, Joe's showing the, uh, what it actually is before it goes on. Um, but it's just a sticker. Yeah, it, and you yeah. stick it on there. But, you know, for... Oh, he's got ten available. I better get one or two. Thirty of those euros ones. plus thirty three yeah. dollars in shipping for, yeah, that. I mean, at that rate, you could just build your own keyboard. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it... and and that and you're gonna be hard pressed to find that anywhere. So you know, okay. if your if yours is worn out or you want to have a backup, it looks like uh, Joe would... is trying to show us. Uh, oh, hang on, Joe. Yeah. Can you me, can you me, see that? I'm gonna spot I just made you, new keycaps. Yeah, the keycaps, good luck. But um Oh shoot. Oh you, you I lost you I made new ones. Oh you made new ones. Yeah. How did what did you do, oh, Joe? Oh, it's not in focus. That's pretty good. That's, I can see it good. That looks really cool. What did you do? Um basically just uh drew pictures and printed them off and then um uh laminated them. Okay and glued them onto the top of the keys. Is that just paper, Joe? Uh, yeah. There's paper with a laminate on top. Okay. Oh. A thin laminate, and it, it never wears out. Oh, interesting. Huh. I, you know, there's a um... share that you should share that file out, Joe. I, I yeah, I will have to find it. Um, <laughs> I, I, that's that was three computers ago or more you know <laughs> but yeah i could look i could look up where i uh i should have saved it somewhere well you know joe if you have time to fix individual bits in uh you know 1000 tape files uh surely you have time to recreate that for us <laughs> well you know i can't say that i'm part of many boring meetings but you get the idea <laughs> So you get a lot done during this one, right? <laughs> Actually, I'm reloading a Windows 98 machine right behind me right now. <laughs> oh, dear God. We can create a, a keyboard standalone version. If we have the the names of the keys, we have the keys. That's only you need the PCB and the switches. Well, you'd be surprised how little there is in the 2068 
uh, key switch mechanism. It's it's pretty minimal. If I recall correctly, it's a, a rubber domes inside. Well, David David's also made a well. I mean, other people too, but David's made a, a keyboard. You know, a, a mechanical keyboard replacement. Yeah, yeah, but getting those uh, getting keycaps, um, you know that look like you know the the 2068 keycaps is a little bit of a challenge um especially in a low profile you can get the high profile um you know sort of standard keycaps from the WASD and stuff like that but um <clears throat> it's it's last i looked it was 50 bucks a set plus um plus shipping which is i don't know i don't know how expensive that is for folks it's not bad it's okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, D David, do you know how much of that is is uh, NRE and how much of it is keycap? I mean, for instance, if you were to buy ten sets, would, oh, the would there be a discount? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I can look into that. I didn't think about that. Hmm. Hmm. I've been off my meds lately, so you know, I'd probably be interested in getting a set. Well, so Jeff, let's talk about you being off your meds. And the thing you held up before the meeting. <laughs> um, you want to talk? Extra keys? Do you want to talk, Jeff, for a few minutes about your um, your little circuit board and box there? Oh, um, this this is the first shot of a prototype of the twenty sixty eight E. Um, right now, uh, I'm. I literally got this on Friday afternoon, so I've only been able to uh, get the FPGA mounted and, along with some, you know, the power supply and things like that. But the the upshot of it is that uh, we have a an expanded bus that's compatible with the TC twenty sixty eight here. Um, some circuitry for the audio circuit uh, for VGA here, and places for three Picos that are going to handle uh, the disk drive, uh, well, mass storage keyboard, the USB keyboard, and uh, the, the two mice, and then a uh, Pico W that is going to be slated to do the uh, do wireless communication. Uh, so, like I said, it's still very much a work in progress. So far, the FPGA uh, seems to be... Uh, uh, seems to be working and working properly. So I, I don't know how much anyone else wants to know about it, but uh, as I said, this this came out of the discussions we've been having on this group and in the in the hardware group. So uh, we will keep you informed as to what's going on. Uh, but like I said, <laughs> coolness. Yeah, yeah. And, and the turnaround time, you were, you know, you you sent that that file off in two weeks maybe that's just insane yeah and, it is you know what can be done now um and so the the smaller things down at the bottom those are going to be uh i think the company's called waveshare uh yeah. rp 2040s which is just a, a smaller version of a, a pico and um um and you said there's going to be Pico W for, you know, wireless communication and the internet. <laughs> so I guess that means somebody oh. needs to write a web browser uh, for the 2068. Oh. Right. In, in case that you consider to recreate a new keyboard, please add four or five keys in to control, for example, escape and I don't know, insert and break. Or well, whatever, yeah. In case well, I'm, we... I'm presently so looking at uh, Gustavo. I'm presently looking at at using just a standard US key, USB keyboard. Although, you know, we could we could replace if you get the right keyboard, you could replace the keycaps as you so desire. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. And, and one of the other things that we talked about um, is a little board that if you have a dead 2068. But you know the keyboard still works. A little board that would go, you could put inside your 2068. You would plug your um, your 2068 keyboard into it, 
and it would spit out it would act, uh, turn your 2068 into a USB keyboard. So you can, you know, still live the dream of the <laughs> 2068 keyboard uh, with this, you know, this new box that Jeff's working on. Jeff, how long did it take you to design design that? Um, about a week and a half. Oh, that long, huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it was longer than it should have taken, but... <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Yeah, just just lucky that it lives in another state, and some you know someone can't come over and just physically crack the whip. <laughs> hey, that's why I retired. No rest for you, Jeff. <laughs> Very cool, Adam. Did you cover all the things that you wanted to cover? Uh, the only thing I didn't cover was um, I was able to connect to a Spectrum um, BBS. Uh, but not a well a real spectrum BBS. I, I can't remember if it was um, in England or the U, the England or Italy because there's two that I found, um, and I connected to them via Telnet, and I think I was talking to the one in England, uh, and um, he said it should be possible to connect my 2068 via Telnet um, once I dial into one of those networked um, Linux machines. Um, he gave me basically brief instructions on what I need to do on his side to uh, turn off all the extra crap because he's using ANSI and, you know, all those 90s things. And maybe I guess even 80s things too, but, you know, like it's 80 columns, it's got color. Of course, I can't do any of that. But I can, he said I could should be able to connect um, via uh, ASCII after turning off all his stuff, changing my column width probably to 40, I think only. And so I'll have to use that Z term um program that will support uh 68 columns but well, it should work and I, I do plan to try it out um i don't know what i'm gonna do with it except i'm gonna try the the infocom games for my 2068 because those um those did work um it had i played zork one on the uh, zx uh bbs which is i don't know what the point was you, you can play uh infocom games in a million different ways and Probably playing via Telnet on a ZX um, bulletin board isn't the best way to go about it, but you know, it's it's fun. <laughs> uh, it's, Adam, actually, um, I don't remember which meeting it was that we talked. We talked about this about uh, uh, ZX Z term rather, sure. Um, and we have the program, and Keith said he had the manual, and li literally fifteen minutes after we started this meeting. Keith, you know, 10, 10 minutes and 15 minutes after he sent me uh, two copies or maybe it's two two parts of the, the entire um, manual. So we now oh, have a manual. That would be great because uh -huh. it was, oh, yes. okay. That'd make using Z-Term way easier. Absolutely. Yes. And, I'm, and I plan to uh, use it to test, you know, that little um, modem-y thing that I'm working. Oh, Joe found uh, his keyboard file, a PDF file. Cool. Everybody rush to the chat right now and download it. <laughs> <laughs> it's only uh, 110K. That's yeah. Crazy. You could you can yeah, almost store it not. on your 2068. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just black and white. So. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's a summary of what we did on Baud Day. Um, if there's ever another one, um, I, I do want to try to connect with another uh, Timex computer. I'm not sure how that would work. But, you know, I guess I don't have to wait for another Baud Day. I could do that on a regular day but uh it was a fun time to get together with local people well you know i was thinking adam about bod day and when the next one could happen and if it's going to be the the same sequence the next one won't happen for 24 more years and well they're actually having one in december because they do their months differently you know their month oh that's right yeah. that's right okay so we can cheat with uh with yeah. december got it <laughs> okay um right 12 3 24 but then after that uh, the next step after 24 is 48. I don't know um, if yeah, I guess so. But so, you know, were there really 48K modem or 4,800 baud modems? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Probably. Goodness. I Probably. skipped those. Yeah, uh, it was short, but, um, you know, it wasn't long after that 96 and faster modems. Well, you can, you can wait till 2096 if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I plan to do it. Uh, fry style. I'm just going to get myself cryogenically preserved and pop out and <clears throat> and, and hope everything works out okay. 
hope we haven't been invaded by an aliens at that point um i wanted to say uh uh about joe's file that um i have i have this bizarre uh set of stickers for um for uh uh I think it's for folks with a spectrum who want to use a real keyboard and it's um, the, the stickers themselves are, are sized for uh, real keys. But then I also have these other little pieces of paper. There's like sticker paper um, that have something like what Joe did for the 2068. Uh, and this is really black, uh, heavy black border around each, each key. And you have to, you know, cut it out yourself. I'll dig those things up and and um, you know bring them to the next meeting, uh, just because it's they're so bizarre. Um, Carl, talk to us quickly. What? Talk to us quickly Who? about your fifteen ten work. Yeah, there seems to be quite a bit of interest with that. Um, uh, you know, and 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 I kind of want to bring Ryan into this because you know he's developed a program to convert, you know, P files into ROM files, right? Now there's a lot of nuances with the different versions of, you know, programs out there. So it's it's not all inclusive because we're still kind of figuring that out. Um, but, uh, you know, he has done, you know, I sent him a bunch of games that I kind of wanted to get converted and he did run through them and converted the ones that were easy, right? Some of them he found out, <laughs> They're not so easy. There's some other things going on. Um, so now I think we're up to what, maybe 14 titles, Ryan. I I, I put posted it on the you know the groups I O, but uh, uh, you know like Mazogs and Frogger and Timex Pinball, Grimm's Fairy Trails. I think you you did that one, Ryan, on your own. Um, but I think you uh, also did those two Donkey Kong clones that uh, David posted. Oh, did you? Oh, cool. I think so. For me, yeah, I did. I did. I did. Uh, Crazy Kong. That one I could do myself. And then uh, Kong's Revenge. Uh, I don't particularly care for that game. It's kind of slow because it's all written in basic. It looks like to me that thing is 13K plus long. <laughs> That's a lot of basic. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I think Kong Crazy Kong is a much faster paced game to me. But, you know, Kong's Revenge was a tough one for me. Uh, I couldn't convert it. You know, I tried, but uh, Ryan, Ryan got it through his program or, you know, cause some of them use variables and things like that. And I know I kind of get technical with these things, but anyway, I just wanted to say that, you know, we are looking at, you know, making more games available. Uh, so, you know, if people have, have a favorite or, you know, uh, I'm kind of even thinking of, you know, maybe not necessarily games, but maybe there's, uh, applications that you might want to make a cartridge out of. You know, we've, we're trying to do the yeah. view calc and the view uh, file, but I think Ryan was running into some issues with those right off the bat. So, I mean, not to say that it won't happen, but, um, you know, there's, and then there's obviously the problem of it, it's going to save to the cassette if you if you make a file in view file or, you know, view 3D or whatever, not view 3D, but um, that's only for the 2068. But, uh, and, yeah. Yeah, but ViewCal can, uh, you know, but um, I, I had in my mind like an application, maybe like Hot Z, I kind of think for the 1000, um, but I can't really find a Hot Z uh, out there uh, that's for the, the, for the 1000. And I know Ray made it for the 1000. That was the initial one that he made, you know, before the 2068 came out. So I know there's a Hot Z out there for the 1000 or the ZX81 either way, but um I'd like to see that get on my cartridge because that would be much easier to uh, load than you know having to load that by tape. So, um, so Carl, I do have uh, some tapes that look like they are hot Z for the one thousand. Okay. So I just need to get uh, you know need to get in there and spend some quality Joe time adjusting bits. <laughs> Well, they might they might read in fine. You never know. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, I'd like to certainly get hot Z. You know, I'm partial to Hot Z, obviously, just from my experience with it and, and Ray being here in New Mexico. Um, but um, it would just be easier to load that, you know, with a cartridge than, than. And then, you know, David's kind of mentioned, 
well, he David wants to get one, so that's kind of nice. Uh, yeah, I, I want to play with one. <laughs> and then, um, so uh, I've been building up some here this week. Uh, so hopefully I can get you know some shipped out this week. But um, the other thing is, is uh, I sent you an email, David, about you know some of my ideas with that, right? So I kind of want to put a bigger chip on the cartridge. And I think that we can still use the existing interface so that folks that have already bought, uh, you know, something from me, yeah. the cartridge would change, right? The cartridge would, uh, I'm, I'm looking at probably a 256 kilo, you know, K byte chip yeah. so that you could store uh, like 16 uh, programs on the chip instead of the four that we have now, which is kind of. I mean, it's cool that you can have four. Uh, I think originally it was just we only had four Timex ones, right? That's all we needed. But uh, and remind I think me, we... Carl, how how is it that um, how is it that you switch between the different slots, as it were? Well, you know, on Claudius's design, you know, he uses the dip switches to go to the address lines, right, on the okay. chip. So you just you just changing the address lines, higher low. Uh, and then I added the A15 line for the, you know, the the 64K chip so that it can address high memory, right? Mm -hmm. A15 uh, is starting at 32K and up, right? And anything but with A15 off is below 32K. So yeah. uh, that's kind of how we split up the, uh, you know, the 8K chunks or the 8K file sizes, right? That the, the cartridge is expecting. And then I kind of made that little diode and gate on the you know that's a mod i did on the interface so that we could select the higher uh 8k chunks that the you know the the machine yes. code reads yes. right so we had to modify the cartridge the interface board to to allow that to happen right but anyway that should all be the same i think even with a bigger chip but with a bigger chip once you get bigger than 64k right you move up into the uh a 32 pin dip mm -hmm. instead of the 28 pin dips right and so that's a wider chip obviously and then uh, you need a bigger dip switch right you need oh, a four true. position or a five position right or however big we want to go there so i think you know, the cartridge, the chip would have to move down maybe on the cartridge. And so that would give room for the bigger dip switch above it. And well, so uh, I had a thought about that, Carl. Mm -hmm. There's um, there's a, a, a rotary switch available. Yes, right. That, um, you know, puts out. 16. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, the one I have, the one I'm, I have uh, does does uh, eight. So it's three, three pins. Oh, okay. Um, does eight values um in binary um but yeah yeah and that might make some more sense because that that rotary switch is really nice i mean it's, it's a little small uh you know but i think most of us can handle that <laughs> yeah it'd probably be more convenient than, than setting a bunch of dip switches i get that but um well, you know and then... be, it'll also be like cooler i think you put a nice knob on <laughs> yeah you probably could get a knob for it yeah yeah, I don't know. Uh, Maybe... You know, I mean, I, you know, I'm thinking of expanding this to some degree, but you know, I, you know, again, it's it's what's the market for it? You know, I don't mm -hmm. know. I'm 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 to be honest with you, kind of surprised at the interest that it's really generated. But then again, uh, you know, I think people, you know, I mean, it's it's certainly not an emulator, right? An emulator, you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. But um, and go and ahead. That's the thing. That's the thing. Um you know, uh, Carl, is that there are folks, you know, who, who, you know, it's surprising, but who have an interest in, in this sort of thing, right? Uh, because you've gotten a lot of people saying, yeah, I want one of those. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, if, if we cleaned up the circuit with your, your mods and, um, you know, it depends upon how much free time you want to lose uh you know you could put it up on on ebay and i bet you a bunch of people would be really interested yeah um, probably and i did mention to you david that maybe we can have it on your store so I mean, oh yeah yeah okay wanted to buy sure. it uh they could just that way you know we kind of keep it in the family so to speak right um and uh you know again you know with ryan's program and you know, i haven't really talked to paul faro about you know him doing the same kind of thing 
I kind of said, well, let's, you know, let Ryan run with this. And then so, you know, we can convert more, you know, we're going to make more titles available, right? So that um, it's kind of give it, gives it a little bit more life. Yeah. Right. We're not, we're not just copying the Timex software and that's it. You know, now we can, you know, put basically, hopefully at some point, any program that was for the ZX81 or the 1000 onto a cartridge. Very cool. Yeah. Carla, uh, you know, I've been following it avidly watching, you know, the, the, the back and forth on the groups.io and, you know, the progress you're making and the folks, uh, you know, who, um, you know, who seem to have kind of excited, but it's, like you said, it's surprising, but you know, on the other yeah. hand, it's kind of not surprising. True. Uh, at least, at least for you know, for me, based on you know uh, how much interest I've seen, you know, folks express in. Well, I think part of like it that. is, yeah, I think part of it is it's you know people are using the real hardware, you know, yeah. kind of you kind of like using the real hardware, and you kind of take the tape deck out of it, right? I mean, three yeah. D Monster Maze took what. You know, like four <laughs> minutes to load, right? So it's kind of like with a cartridge, you know, you're pretty much you're up in in, in twenty seconds, right? So it's just Quickly. plus yeah. you don't have the pro you don't have the problem of oh shit, it didn't load right, so you just wasted, <laughs> you know. Yep. Yes, so I think that's kind of maybe a part of it is uh you know the instant you know no no tape loading problems um, and, with that machine. And so Go ahead. Mike Mike ironically asks, will it work with the fifteen hundred, Mike? This is a clone of the 1510 uh this is the the cartridge device uh you know meant for the 1500 <laughs> so <Right>. yeah <laughs> it'll work with the 1500 it's for for folks who have the you know a 1000 you have to type in rand user 8192 or something right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah because the rom doesn't auto run it not a right run. the 1500 yeah. run 1500's rom actually checks for the cartridge yeah, yeah. um cool and that's kind of what I built with my, you know, 1000 to 1500 conversion project. That's what I test all this stuff on. Right. So it auto always auto runs for me. Auto, auto runs for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, even though it's on a 1000 quote unquote, right. It's yeah. I, I not using it in a 1500 per se, but, uh, and the other thing too, is kind of looking at the interface board, maybe, uh, you know, uh, down the road is to be able to load ROM software right okay. to replace the rom oh, and i was reading yeah i was reading about uh some things that it's not just as simple as replacing the rom because of the way the video routines work and uh the video routines need to have mirrors of the you know the the home rom you know the 8k rom higher up in memory because oh. that's how the display works in the zx81 hmm. is it doesn't really read the rom it reads the mirror copy of it for the that's... for the character set Right. Okay. And it's kind of assuming that that is that mirror will be there in the higher memory. Uh, I want to go ahead, Gustavo. Mm -hmm. A question. Uh, I, I know then um, 1500 user, but <clears throat> do you know if there exists any documentation about the cartridge regarding? See, that's the, the other the thing that, yeah, that me and David had discussed is there is, uh, as far as I know, there is nothing about how Timex did that. Yeah. Right. Right. And oh. and if you look at the machine code that is in the cartridges, they are different, right? Flight simulator is pretty simple. Um, it just basically copies a box, sets a few little things up, and runs it. Now, Ryan has run into the thing where, like chess, for instance, uses variables. It may hmm. store code in the variable area, actually, I think. Oh. But Ryan can maybe talk more about that. So it's a little yeah. different. Yeah, no, it's a little I, I different remember, program. I remember year, years old. Uh, the number one, maybe it's a flag that the ROM system detects if the card is exists or not. I don't remember exactly the position, but I assume that if the 8192, maybe, is the card flag uh, ROM exists. Uh, right, the, right. The ROM does look for ROM. A... Yes, see mm -hmm. if this bit exists. If not, right. run the load BC instruction of the C80. Well, yeah, it does use an 01 at 2000 hex. That's what it checks to see if there's a cartridge there or not. But it's a dummy instruction. Exactly. Uh, when, when, yeah, when you read it, it, it it still will run it, but it doesn't do anything, right? It's just a dummy instruction that's kind of taking up mm -hmm. space there. But So, uh, Ryan, okay. you, you wrote a program, which you've posted in the chat. Um, 
that is part of your sort of larger set of CX81 utilities? Yeah, um, which do have a few uh, spectrum <laughs> tap file things in there, but um, yeah, I just made it one of those. Why not? Um, and uh, so basically, I took the loaders of the existing ones and sort of unified and expanded those. Um, but the, the ones for the existing four programs were just sort of, well, it just had the parts it needed for that program. I mean, they only did four. Probably they were still getting it set up. But basically, just it just loads the what it needs to. So for a generic uh, converter, basically, you can have a program and possibly variables. So um, some programs do save the variables and then they they just run with those initial values. Mm -hmm. Some do more uh, clever things like, you know, that's like the chess program. The machine code is in the variables. Oh, okay. The program is only a few lines. And so for that, I just basically made the loader say, well, either the program you can have program and variables or just program and you can option if you don't want to include the variables. Um, and then the program could be big, so it could be split across the two 8K parts or like chess, it could be a small program with large variables, although chess still is not that big, but potentially even if the variables are huge, it could split it across the 8K blocks. And um, so then, so the only thing it doesn't store is the display file, right? I, le I left that, nothing really, <laughs> I've never seen a program that saves uses the display, saves file. display file as an initial, initial thing. So the loader just creates a collapsed one and then calls uh, the clear screen routine to expand it out. Interesting, okay. So I just basically put all those pieces together and extend and extended the scheme that it, that it was using. And uh, then the program has some options for like, okay, uh, do you want, do you want actually two 8K ROM images um, or not? And uh, you can just run it. There's an info mode where you just, it just tells you about the file. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's going to get, I think most programs, but of course, a lot of these, are commercial things and they were and so you quickly you know probably all the things i ever wrote it's going to be run just fine on but you get into these commercial programs you start running into problems and these weird ways they were developed and i think chess shows that they had a development system that was putting that was they would write machine code and store it in high memory and then but it was stored in sort of a variable <laughs> And then oh, they crazy. would get rid of the, the development program and then just slide a loader in there with the with the machine code still in memory, but it's inside a variable that's declared to preserve it, or else they surround that, create a variable definition and variable table that surrounds that machine code, probably so that they can develop it in memory and then otherwise, how do you, you know, how do those development systems work? I think it leaves it in memory and then they look, then it creates a little basic program that's going to call it. So basically that, that kind of thing, you have to save the variables. Others do something like that. So that's the problem I'm running in with. Uh, Ryan, can we back up? I want to ask you about that. Like if there was, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, which one? I, like uh, if, if you had a development system, would it like, I mean, I, obviously you don't know for sure, but would it have been running like on a CPM machine or something in 82? Oh, I, I have no idea, but I do know that some things were developed like that on a different system. Okay. Uh, um, but yeah, I don't know exactly how some of some of these like that chess program were done, but it's like, otherwise, why would you store it in the variable other than so the other thing it, it, it lets you not have a giant REM statement. I think copy yeah, protection, other, Ryan. 
Yeah. The other thing I kind of thought about, Ryan, is maybe your program can do a snapshot, maybe from an emulator. That way, you know, we can capture the 16K of RAM, right? If it's copy protected or something like that, we can load it in an emulator, get it running in the emulator, and then do a snapshot of it and make that a cartridge. Oh. And figure out how to make it run, you know, auto run and stuff like that. Because then everything's loaded up, right? It's in the right positions in memory, blah, blah, blah. And then we just snapshot the whole 16K, you know, it's nothing. 16, you know, we can definitely make 16K of code into the flash chip. So then you just kind of snapshot the program running. And then... Well, so here's the thing about that. That sounds like it'll work. <laughs> well, it also sounds like that when you load the P file for view file, it loads and runs. That P file contains every byte that you need. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yet when you convert it, it fails. Hmm. Even with the variables in place, it basically stores a machine code program in the variables and it calls that as soon as it right after it loads that routine does a little crc check you know mm -hmm. and what it does is then it'll say oh failed and uh i'll i just can't figure out what is it testing that i did not load from the p file so there basically well, is not, there's not anything that, that, that can be outside that P file that it needs. The only thing I can conclude is, is that I need to load some of the other system variables and it's checking that as well because there's nothing in the P file that is outside, that it does, that it needs because the P file will load and work. So right. I, I got to figure out what it's doing. I'm loading the variables, which loads the machine code. And it runs and it says failed. So I suspect that it's checking a couple of system variables. This is not an old, this is not a new thing. You know, there used to be some tricks there because um, that you, you poke some values in a unused system variable and then it expects that. So I got to go through the, dis I got to try to disassemble that, that checker program and see yeah. what it's looking and I used to do kind of cracking. I mean, when I was my senior in high school, I got a specials, uh, you know, class that was made just for me. And the teacher, that's what he gave me. He gave me commercial software to crack. And so, I mean, a lot of times what, you know, for something like that, if it's, make, it's generating a CRC and it's not getting in the right one, we could just knock that whole routine out or just make it true well, all the time. Right. But, well, um, but that's the problem is I don't want to do that. Okay. Because that means I've got to go manually muck with. The well, thing. true. Okay, so uh, and but so but basically, sometimes but sometimes you have to crack the copy protection. <laughs> you want to, you know. But granted, no. the fact of the matter is, is it loads in an emulator and it works. So I mean, right? Uh, yeah, the anyway. file loads in an emulator, so it's just a. I think it's a system variable it's looking at, and I just need to start adding that to what I'm loading from the PFAR. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl, if you need a snapshot of any machine, this is a theory, it's not the pen of the machine. You need to catch the, the, the block data with any modification, without any modification. And the best way to do that is run outside the machine because if you have a routine or you have any, any use any space to locate the save routine, you are modifying the, the, the RAM. And you will not be sure that in this space does not exist any data for the program or for, for the machine in this time. That is impossible to save the, the, the entry RAM block without any modification, including the stack pointer or the another system variable routines, no? That's why is is the recommendation is use an external program in this case this emulator to catch the image file. It's better. Yeah, and that's why I've got to mention in the emulator because I know in eighty one you can you can catch you do you can make snapshots of the whole thing. So that is just another tool. The, the emulator cannot save all the RAM. The I believe it, it can. 
Yeah, I believe I they think, can. Yeah, I think eighty one okay. has some nice memory, um, uh, you know, debugging, oh. watching tools, or if not, okay. not eighty one. You can write in emulator all the RAM block full for the first to the last position, and then create a special cartridge to load this. And that's it. Yeah, it's easy. exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. So, now Paul had his hand up. I saw his big hand in the in the yep, screen. Yep, so. that was me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Uh, many years ago, I needed to secure a program. I figured out a way to create a REM file line with just zero comma zero comma and then store my data in the hidden bytes of the number and all i did was load the line i had multiple lines like that scattered throughout the program hmm. then i included removed the loading routine and included the reading out routine that then stuffed that information somewhere else. But yeah, and see, that's where I think like an emulator. Go ahead. Well, you can well, at least use the emulator yeah, to see what's going on. Go ahead, Paul. If anybody tried to edit the REM line, it blew all the data. Right. Sure. Yes, but I've already said everything you need is in the P file. Yeah. I'm loading all of that. Right. So do the same any of that way kind with of, a, any, a string. Because the numbers kind of that, are still stored with the hidden no, bytes. I, no, I get it, but I'm loading those bytes. So that kind of thing is covered. Okay. So, okay. and I'm not going to do a snapshot because that's just, the that's whole the, point of this is like, if, 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 if I had a custom custom do all these games i'll have to do them all myself okay <laughs> the whole point of this was you run this program on a p file if that p file works then it'll load up now turn into a that's, cartridge that's one p file okay so eventually i could crack what's going on with view file and that kind of thing so but you, a... you get stuff like the the uh the other ones that 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 uh Carl sent me, which was these uh, Quicksilver games. Oh dear. Um, and so, um, they yeah, come the with more than, right. They come with more than one P file. Oh yeah, because so the Quicksilver had some hardware, right? If you guys, well, well, you guys probably don't remember, but they had a, they had a. They had a Caric C H A R hardware thing that yep. you could plug in for high yep. res graphics, and they had a sound thing you could plug in for to, for sound. And so I think some of these P files take advantage of that hardware. But if you don't have it, then it, it doesn't, right? You, I guess you have to load another one, another P file. Yeah. So. Right, right? So yes, the first loader sets up the custom hardware. So number one. If you want to use this correctly, you got to have that custom hardware ready. Right. Um, well, that's I was reading about that. And it says you can use them without any of that hardware. It's that's what they said. You won't take true. advantage of. Yeah. It just won't look as good. Yeah. Right. But the asteroids don't look really great. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I understand that. Yeah. It's it's um, kind of like a mute point, but. Me, and you know so, that kind of brings up a thing is can we emulate that or not emulate that but can we put that on the interface of the cartridge you know maybe some of these things like that that, that extra like that yeah that cares thing um i got i got two things uh related to this one of which is there's this guy named bob smith and he um writes a lot of uh programs for the 81 and for the spectrum and I'm going to just do a real quick screen share here because it looks like there's a bunch of really good candidates, um, Carl and Ryan, in case you, you know, don't have enough things to do with your free time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's a bunch of programs here that look, look really cool. Maybe not, maybe not this steps one, uh, but, you know, Crossy Road in case you're wanting to, you know, uh, have that experience. Um my vote is for this one called Impact, which kind of looks like it might be Omega Race slash um, 
asteroids. I'll drop the the link in the uh, in the chat. Um, but he's written a bunch of you know 16k uh, ZX81 games that look really pretty good. Um, that might be worth um, might be worth trying to turn it into carts. Yeah, yeah. And the other reason I bring this up is our erstwhile uh, treasurer uh, Tim. Tim, you there? <laughs> yep, I'm here. Our erstwhile treasurer uh had had an idea about the spectrum games that bob has written so you want to float that and now now having said this according to this uh according to this page tim um bob is powered by cider strong cheese more cider loud music even more cider tea and more cider than you can ever imagine and falling over now of those things <laughs> okay uh cider cheese and tea maybe loud music we'd have to find out what his tastes are <laughs> so in thinking about maybe we talked about porting you know spectrum games spectrum games to the 2068 i was thinking that if we talked to bob uh he might be interested and since we have funds set aside for whatever uh we can entice him to do it by by saying hey for every game you port, we'll pay you X number of dollars. It could be something like, you know, a couple of cases of cider. It could be something like, uh, not a crate, but, you know, so I'm thinking like maybe $50 per game, maybe a hundred. Something like that might be enticing. Uh, he's still active. I mean, these games were done a few years ago, but as far as I know, he's still active on some of the webs, uh, the forums out there. And, in, in, you know, so he's not like he's gone away. Mm -hmm. So... We have, you know, over 2,000 to play with, so we could probably spend, you know, a little bit. And I haven't talked to him, I haven't suggested this to him, so he may or may not be interested, but I thought I'd bring it forward here to see if there's something we want to do. Because some of those look interesting. And now, now yeah. he released a source code we could tinker, but he hasn't released a source code, so. Right, right. I thought we'd just go to him after a little bit of a little bit of money for cider, and he might be interested in porting it. And maybe it's as simple as just a, a few uh, calls, you know, ROM calls. Yeah, or if he could enhance it, maybe use the sound chip and and joysticks and stuff like that. Well, he's got some for the Spectrum One Twenty Eight, which has the AY chip. It's just that the output is different. Right. So again, if we provide him the details of the twenty sixty eight ROM calls, um, provide him the details for how to how to address the uh, the AY chip uh, on the twenty sixty eight versus the versus the Spectrum One Twenty Eight. So we give him that information. We go, oh yeah, give me you know a month or two to do to do port this over, and of course with emulators he can test because you know tons of, you know, like the ZSRX emulator multi-platform has multiple systems. Right. So, right. Just thought I'd suggest that. Yeah, that sounds so at least uh, worth a try. <laughs> well, you know, there's there's seventeen of us here right now, and we have no official count of our members um y'all want to do a show of hands i wonder if i could do a poll i could probably do a poll thing um but i'm not gonna try to figure that out right now <laughs> well how about have everyone take a look at bob's website yeah of the spectrum games and say and pick a a 48k spectrum game and a 128 and we can because i don't know how difficult the 128 would be the port and say hey we're interested in these these two games are my ones i'm interested in. and we you uh, just reply, maybe reply back to the um, email list and I can just collect it all and say, okay, the top one is this for 48K and the top 128K is this one. And we just, and then I approach Bob. I like it. I like it. Yep. Um, I want to point out that um, not all Spectrum programs require, you know, some kind of conversion to uh, run on the 2068 and one uh, program in particular is, and maybe because of this, this person has written it for portability is this thing called Tenebra. I'm gonna guess on the pronunciation. Um, his original version, you can see it's for a bunch of different platforms. The Spectrum version, which is all of $2. Oh, actually it's, it's name your own price. Okay. Um, the Spectrum version, runs in um in browser in emulators rather as um in the 2068 mode and actually i'll i'll, I'll have to download it to uh 
to um oh whoops that's not very big um i'll have to download it to the to the pico and test it out on real hardware um what kind of a game is it david it is i a roguelike so you're you know a single character in a dungeon type setting and as you move around um the you know the world around you gets gets illuminated and it seems to be level based it says there's 31 levels and um you know i've only played it a little bit but basically you're okay so it says uh find oil ba- oil barrels to make your torches brighter squeeze through cracks in broken walls fix broken rails with a hammer broken rails hmm okay um it sounds like work it does sound like work yes uh and this may be why i didn't get very far in it <laughs> <laughs> um but i like roguelike games um for about five minutes and this entertained me for about five minutes uh, <laughs> yeah that's how i am about roguelike games <laughs> um yeah and the other thing that i wanted to do was give a shout out to uh charlie day who's not here um i guess charlie spends a lot of time in real life on zoom like i do uh <clears throat> and so Anyway, Charlie uh, sent me a big box of uh, some really cool, rare stuff uh, that, that I have not seen before, um, including this little number right here. You all see that? That is a Timex Computer, Computer Club. Club card. And it's embossed with the number, but it's, it's got some text on the back, right? Um, and it's embossed with your number, and it gives you a space to sign your your signature and i can i can make out charlie's uh signature so i took this um i took the card and uh the actually that timex thing is is available from wikipedia uh so okay, we, did we that totally as... need those for our uh timex group here we we need that reproduction yeah i got that's... i got 50 okay, made okay. so far i got i gotta adjust oh. the <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> So, you know, if you've ordered a, uh, you know, a Pico or, or something else from me, you know, you've, you've probably received, you know, the thing you ordered and a little something extra. Like I've got these 2068 stickers at one point. Oh, hey, let me just spotlight Ryan. Uh, I've got these. Um, oh, is that Asteroids? Is that the, is that that game, Ryan? Yes. Cool. That looks great. Make it a cart. <laughs> Well, I take that shoes on the Quicksilver hardware, right? No, no, that's that's. I think that's from Bob's Games, right? Yeah. 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 I just, oh. I just download, okay. Nice. I just download. I just downloaded and converted it. So, um, you just converted it to a cartridge just now. That's what the program's for. Holy crap! Well, well geez, what? it works. <laughs> wow. Well, it doesn't work for everything, but it works for a lot of things, apparently. Yes. Well, okay, so basically it's interesting because it didn't work the first time with the defaults. And so um, because the auto start line in the in the P file seems to be wrong because it came up and gave an error code, but the program wasn't saved from the save line. So hmm. the auto start line is wrong. So I just said, well, auto start with line four, which was, looked like the correct thing and then it worked fine boom that's awesome ryan so carl one more thing to add to your list one more program <laughs> yeah well hey you know like i said that's why i think we need a bigger cartridge uh because four cartridges you know people are starting to buy three three cartridges at a time oh know? wow okay yeah and so uh, well, i do you know, i do have a I did have a comment about that is it i think or maybe we could vote on that but it seems like part of the thing is if you just had one cartridge you're never plugging in a cartridge you're you're just that seems it. to be p- part of the fun you know of switching cartridges absolutely yes no, otherwise no. you know you just get a back bit throw the p files on there hey that reminds me joe is joe still here joe do you have one of these things from carl no i uh, asked for one but i haven't heard I, I all i really need is just like a board set well and and joe would you be willing to give it a go at making a uh, an STL file uh, for both the 
you know the the carrier unit itself and then for the cartridges yeah i can try see there we go yeah okay. joe i said you know sorry you know there's so many emails i gotta get through and so yeah <laughs> I, I have i remember seeing yours but it's like you know this ain't my full-time job either right? no, <laughs> so, I, it, it's not like i don't have enough projects to keep me busy right now uh, right. but yeah i would like to get a uh a card set i think i have everything else that's on there okay hmm. Because I know some people have wondered how to program. You know, I, I know Johnny Red. Yours is in the mail. It's uh, hopefully he gets it without any problems because he's in Portugal. So uh, Canada doesn't seem to be a big deal because I think uh, Richard got his uh, up in Canada, no problem. So, um, but you know, it's just uh, I want to get people to you know maybe program their own chip. You know, you can take the chip off of the cartridge. It's in a socket. You just need the programmer, right? And then you can kind of update your own cartridge there. But a lot of you know, a lot of people don't want to deal with that either. So, um, but uh, you know, there's nothing really. I explained to Johnny how to do it because, it, you know, it's not as simple as you think because you got to kind of split the 8K programs up yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and load it in different spots than the flash chip. Now, the flat programmer I'm using the program the program i use to flash it you can change where you load things right so it's kind of easy within the program to do that uh but i you know i don't know what other programmers people are going to have and i'm sure you know there's ways to do that in those programs too but it's just yeah. you have to realize you can't just load contiguous 16k cartridge images on there uh it doesn't work that way the way the timex made the hardware right hey guys um, uh we're down to just a couple of minutes left uh David, is there anything we need to talk Great. about? Before? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, anyway, uh, I just want to finish talking about this for a second. Um, if I, I I throw it in with you know whatever people order, uh, but if you want one, uh, email me and I will throw one in the mail to you uh, because it will cost nothing to mail it. Um, so our next meeting is the first Monday in April, and no joke, it's on the first. <laughs> 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 right we we are meeting on monday on april 1st uh <clears throat> so you know uh who knows what what tomfoolery will transpire um <clears throat> maybe so anyway. out of town then because i'm going to texas uh oh to see um the eclipse but uh and i'll be there quite a while beforehand oh. yeah oh, where are yeah, you going yeah. in texas you know, he, so the the is is Texas going to have a good view of the eclipse? Part of it. Uh, I'm okay. Going to Austin. Oh, okay. They're going to see a full eclipse there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, we don't all meet up at David's house. Just exactly. Happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah da David Ellis is in Austin. Of totality. Um, you remember the guy yeah. who did the the rainbow colored uh, uh, 3D print of the ZX81 case? I uh, do actually. The picture. I saw. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's in Austin as well. Oh. Yeah, um, I will say this. Uh, apparently, Buffalo is like some sort of mega hub for this garbage. So it's um, awesome. Yeah, because it's gonna it's gonna pass right over us and burn our eyes right out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, David, just to well, with Jeff there too. Uh, where are you guys at with the uh, the Pico video board? So real quick, um, I have thirty of them built um and i'm just working on finishing up the manual i mean there's not much manual other than plug it in but there's there's a couple other things uh that are worth worth talking about in the manual um <clears throat> and um i want to make a short little video for it and put that up uh about it and my my guess is let's see today's march 17th before the end of the month we'll have it available okay. yeah yeah, then I put my not, name into the, the list. You know, I saw your one, name. But, yep. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I'm going to do is reach out to the folks who have purchased a, one of those little RGB to HDMI thing boards I used to make and say, um, you know, I know you spent money on this thing and I feel bad about that. And there's this really nice thing available for you now that'll get you all the colors. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. Uh, and do you know Jeff, how much? Of, do you know about how much it's gonna gonna cost? Uh, I'm shooting for for fifty or maybe a little bit less. 
Um, and that's going to go into the slot, or is goes into a slot. Like, well, yes. I, uh, the expansion slot, the one so yes. you can hold more than. Okay. Yep. Yep. And um, at least one person has requested that we make an expansion slot that is less than four slots, and we have a two slotter available. Um, Kevin, who is kind of active on the email list, uh, apparently has his setup. He he bought one. He bought a Pico that plugs directly into the computer, and so it sticks out horizontally, right? Um, <clears throat> and so I've made some circuit boards that are, in theory, a two-slot thing that you would stick on the back of your 2068, and it'll let you plug in the boards horizontally uh, in case you have some sort of low clearance uh, situation going on with your computer. Um, I have to build one of those and test it out, but there's no reason it wouldn't work um so yeah those those options will be available uh end of the month i guess what guess. else are we going to cover in the next meeting that's a we usually talk about that uh so the next meeting i have not yet lined anybody up i am going to poke david all except that david is in his 80s and i'm not sure that he wants to start a meeting at nine o'clock on a monday <laughs> um <clears throat> So David, I'm gonna, I'm suspecting David might want to join us on a on a um, on a Sunday, um, and I don't have anybody anyone lined up, um, you know, for the for the Monday meeting. Although I've got some I've got some feelers out to some Timex folks, and uh, got to twist some arms. <laughs> um, I'll put a list. I'll put a call for call for uh, topics well, on the groups that I have. Go ahead. And another thing too, uh, David, maybe you know, you know, maybe send something to Paul Faro, and maybe he, you know, he's not really uh, into the Timex thing right here, right? But yeah. obviously, he's he's certainly wrote programs and he's developed hardware, and you know, so he is in the community, yeah. just over there in the UK, and maybe he might want to. Uh, yeah, that'd be uh, cool. Yeah. Can you say can something you here? His, his email address. Sure. Okay, and I'll reach out to him and see. Uh... See what he, you know, what he feels like doing. Yeah. And Jeff, I think that gives you plenty of time to finish up the uh, 2068. Oh, Jeff will right? be done by then. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Thank you for your time. It's been fun and, and awesome as usual. Um, the sun's still shining in most places. And, you know, the weather's moderately decent. So go outside. Be less pale. <laughs> hey, steal a bye-bye. All right, bye.